My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Onto the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. On the very day of Jesus' resurrection, there were two of Jesus' followers walking on their way to a village named Emmaus. And Jesus joined them in their conversation, although they didn't recognize it, that it was Jesus. And Jesus took that opportunity to explain to them everything concerning himself in all of the law and in all of the prophets. And finally, they came to their destination, the village of Emmaus. Jesus planned to continue on in his journey, but these two men urged Jesus to come and stay with them in their place of lodging, and so he did so. And they were sitting down at a table, and Jesus broke bread with these two men, and in the breaking of the bread, they recognized that it was Jesus who was in their presence. And these two men who were with Jesus responded to that incident. And this is what they said to each other in Luke 24, verse 32. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? The word made flesh spoke into their lives, and their hearts were aflame. Jesus impacted them at the deepest level of their beings. The Christian faith is foremost a religion of the heart. Yet our common practice is to avoid addressing the heart, and instead we tend to focus on the outward expressions of our faith to the detriment of our own souls. There is, for example, what we might call activism, where we rely on constant activity, busyness, methods, ingenuity, and tireless zeal to define our level of spirituality before the Lord. In this, we base our lives upon external measurements that define our success before God, And as a result, we neglect our hearts. We assume that spirituality is defined by the number of ministerial activities that we are involved in. Or there's also what we might call intellectualism. And this is about handling divine truth in solely an objective manner. It is what we might call head knowledge or book knowledge and intellectualism detached from the affections of the heart. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 says, this knowledge puffs up. And this is why it is important to read the Puritans. They help us move past knowledge for knowledge's sake and they engage the heart. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the true hallmark of greatness is simplicity. It is little minds that are complicated and involved. Pursuing knowledge can be a way of actually avoiding the issues of the heart. 
And then there's the whole area of formalism. Formalism shifts our focus away from the person of God and our relationship with him to the outward forms and practices of our religion. The focus then becomes correctness in behavior and ritual. And God addressed this very thing with his people in Isaiah 29, verse 13, where we read, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. In all these ways, we can appear very spiritual and pious, and yet inwardly dead and barren. So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 calls us back to the heart of the matter concerning our faith. We read, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. This morning, we will consider three points. First, the heart defined. Secondly, keep watch over the heart. And then thirdly, the springs of life. And so first we'll look at the heart defined. And the Hebrew word for heart in this verse 23 is the word lev. If we were to spell it in English letters, it would be L-E-V. So how did the Bible writers define the heart? There's a website called The Bible Project. I would recommend it to you. They have videos that give overviews of every book of the Bible, but they also do uh, word studies. And I used uh, The Bible Project for a word study on the word heart in the Old Testament. And here's some of the things that they point out. First of all, in Bible times, the people understood the heart to be an organ in the body, primarily in the chest, that sustained life. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, we read that Nabal essentially died of a heart attack. But also, since the Israelites had no concept for the brain, they viewed the heart as the center for all human intellectual activity. Your heart is where understanding takes place and wisdom dwells. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding. They also viewed the heart as the place where emotions were experienced. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8, we read, And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? One can have a broken heart filled with sadness, or one can have a heart filled with joy. The heart was also a place where a person made choices or decisions motivated by one's desires. And so it was for David as he had it in his heart to build a temple for God in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 27. The heart is also where our affections are centered. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So the heart is the core of our entire being as humans. The heart is the nucleus or the control center for how we behave and act and speak. The heart is foundational to who we are as individuals. And it seems that if you want to affect real change in your person, then the heart needs to be the focus of your efforts. And yet as God challenged Samuel, so he challenges us with these words. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his outward appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks 
on the heart. We must learn to focus our attention upon the heart. And so we come to our second point, that we are to keep watch over the heart. Notice again, verse 23, it says, keep your heart with all vigilance. And that word keep is the Hebrew word nastar, and it has three meanings, all which apply to this verse as we consider the heart. This word means, first of all, to keep. Secondly, it means to watch over. And thirdly, it means to guard. And so first of all, we are to keep our hearts. Puritan Thomas Watson stated that you are to keep your heart as you would keep a treasure. If you had an expensive diamond or pearl, you would lock it up in a safe place so that no one could take it from you. Do we understand as Christians that we possess a precious treasure of inestimable value in the heart? As Watson stated, the devil and the world would rob you of this jewel. And he goes on and he says, O oh, keep your heart as you would keep your life. If you are robbed of this treasure, you are ruined. Let us realize the prized possession we have in the heart. And not only are we to keep the heart, but we are also to watch over the heart. And when I think of being watchful, I think of the shepherd who watches over his sheep. Shepherds spend a great deal of time watching their flocks, and what looks like passive inactivity is actually continual surveillance and active attentiveness. In Dr. Timothy Laniac's book, While Shepherds Watch Their Flocks, he asked shepherds what they are looking for when they keep watch over their flocks. And he found that shepherds are constantly taking inventory. They are looking out for human and animal threats. They are assessing the weather. They are assessing the vegetation and supplies. They are checking for signs of dehydration, disease, and anxiety. They are inspecting mothers, the young and the sick. They are periodically counting sheep. They are constantly asking questions. Which animals need to be separated today? Which, which ones should stay back tomorrow? Will this one's hoof heal? Why is that you giving so little milk? Will that one give birth to twins? Is it the final year for that buck? And many, many more questions. We must learn to keep watch over our hearts. And this is difficult in that our hearts remain hidden beneath the surface of our lives. Nevertheless, we can apply certain tests. <clears throat> For example, if we are failing in our love towards others, then we can ask ourselves, where has my faith faltered? We know that our hearts are being adversely affected in some way. Perhaps we are clinging to self-preservation or self-reliance or jealousy or pride. We have lost our focus upon the life-giving stream that is Jesus. We must learn to watch in order to catch the failure of the heart before it brings ruin. And then thirdly, we are to guard the heart. We are to station a sentinel at the gateway to the heart so that we are protected from enemy infiltrations. The book of Proverbs is always reminding us to avoid the influences of evil. Proverbs chapter 4 verses 14 through 15 say, Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it. 
and pass on. In John Maxwell's book, he tells, uh, his book that's entitled The Leader Within You, he tells the story of building the Great Wall of China. And uh, when this wall was built, it was so high that no enemy could go over it. It was so thick that no enemy could burrow through it. It was so long that no enemy could go around it. And yet, after a hundred years after it's, it was built, China had been invaded by the enemy three separate times. So how did the enemy invade China if the wall was so high they couldn't go over it, it was so long they couldn't go around it, and it was so thick they couldn't burrow through it? Well, the en enemy invaded by simply going through the gates in the wall. They bribed the guards. The guards stood down, and they went into China by their own will. And it was because the Chinese failed to teach their children integrity and patriotism. They simply sold out to the enemy, and the enemy had their way with them. What about the gateway into your heart? You can possess the thickest, most impenetrable walls but if your gate is not well guarded, then you will be vulnerable. I would like to suggest two things for nurturing your heart. And the first is this. Apply the word of God continually to your heart. Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The word of God is perfect in its entirety. There are not some parts of Scripture that are inferior to others. The Scriptures are perfect through and through, making them fully trustworthy so that we can depend upon them completely by faith. And then we read in that verse that the Word of God revives our soul. Some translations use the word restores our soul. The New King James Version uses the word converting the soul, which comes closer to what is meant here. The idea is that the scriptures enable us to be restored as we repent of our sin so that we are brought back into a right relationship with our Lord. And of course, the word of God always works from the inside first. But then secondly... We want to ask the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. We spoke of this in the call to confession from Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And the Holy Spirit is primarily the searcher of the heart. Because our hearts will deceive us into thinking that we are better than we are. As Augustine's prayer last week directed us, I fear to deceive myself lest my, shin, lest my sin should make me think that I am not sinful. We, we need divine help in the nurturing of our hearts. And then as... We keep our hearts as we watch over our hearts, as we guard our hearts. Then we will see the springs of life flow from our inner being. The heart in this verse belongs to a person redeemed by the blood of Christ and renewed by the Holy Spirit. We know this because the springs of life flow outward from this heart. Nothing good can flow out of a heart unless it has been regenerated and born again by the indwelling of God's Spirit. And so the word springs in this verse, which is the Hebrew word tosiot, literally means goings out or outgoings, meaning the place from which something goes forth. 
Yes, we are to keep the heart. Yes, we are to watch over the heart. Yes, we are to guard the heart. But we are not to continually be so introspective and inwardly focused. And the reason we want our hearts to be healthy is so that the springs of gospel blessing and renewal may flow outward to bring healing, bear fruit, and bring glory to the Lord. And we find the fulfillment of this verse in the person of Jesus Christ. Consider these words from John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So this passage tells us that Jesus stood up on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles in the temple, and he spoke these words with great passion and authority. During each day of the feast, the high priest would lead a procession carrying a gold pitcher filled with water, and the trumpet was sounding, and the choir was singing the Hallel, Psalms 113 through 118 as they processed to the temple. And then when they arrived at the temple, they would encircle the altar. And they would hold up the pitcher of water as dedication to the Lord. And then they would pour out the water on the altar. And they did this in remembrance of how God was so faithful in providing for them during their 40 years of wilderness wanderings. But it was also a sign of future promise that one day from the throne of God this mighty river would flow from God to the nations of the world bringing healing and renewal and fruitfulness and glory to our God and our Savior. And so Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast and he refers to these waters and he announces with boldness I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. I am the waters that will fill the earth and satisfy forever the thirst of my people. And we must not ignore the immensity of the statement. In it we see the glory of our Lord and the abundance that our Lord provides for his own. As was prophesied. In Ezekiel 47, in Zechariah 14, in Revelation chapter 22. But this promise from John 7 is extraordinary for a couple of reasons. And first, the promise has a strong present significance for God's people. In other words, the Greek gives the sense that whoever is presently thirsting and is presently coming to Jesus in faith to drink this person will receive the life-giving power of God's Spirit and the living waters and the living rivers will flow from his life right now. Not 100 years from now, but right now as we come to Jesus. But secondly, we find this promise extraordinary because of the abundant provision Christ promises to every believer that out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not trickles, not dribbles, not drips of living water, but rivers, massive flowing waterways, in the plural, too deep and mighty to wade across or swim across. Read Ezekiel 47 and you will see what I mean. And so do you believe this? Do you believe that this is ours in Christ, this promise today for us? Owen Roberts, the Welsh social reformer, became concerned 
about the pathetic child labor conditions in England during the 19th century. He did his research by entering a coal mine where he found boys, some as young as nine and ten years old, covered with coal dust, working in dangerous and rugged conditions deep in the earth. Roberts found one boy, about 12 years old, coughing and wheezing in the dark tunnel of a mine. The boy was breaking big chunks of coal into smaller chunks, then separating the shale from the coal. Roberts said, how are you doing, son? The boy said, I pull my weight, sir. Roberts produced a water jug he had tied to his belt and uncorked it, offering it to the boy, saying, thirsty? The boy took the jug, tilted it toward his blackened lips. He drank deeply. Then he passed the jug back to Roberts and said, thank you, sir. Roberts said, tell me, son, do you know Jesus? The boy said, no, nobody by that name works around here. Try asking around the north shaft. Owen Roberts' heart was broken that day. Down in the darkness, deep under the earth, he had found a thirsty boy, thirsty for water, but even more thirsty for the living waters that bring eternal life through Christ. This young boy, who spent most of his rugged existence in the darkness covered with coal dust, had never before heard the name Jesus. Jesus said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. And drink. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, watcher of our hearts, search us, know us, and renew us inwardly for your name's sake. We come to you as a people who thirst due to our sin and our fallenness. And now we pray for your spirit to supply rivers to flow from our hearts into the lives of others so that the gospel of salvation and renewal might come to many. O oh, Father, give us the water that will take away our thirst even forever. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat>